tuning in to the online broadcast network, AfterBuzz TV. Over 20 million weekly downloads from over 200 countries and your number one source in after-show entertainment. Johnson. 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 TV, the destination for TV superfans, producing after shows for over 300 of your favorite TV shows, interviewing celebrities and showrunners, and bringing you behind the scenes exclusives. All thanks to E Entertainment's Maria Menunos, producer Kevin Undergaro, and internet leader Akamai. Now, let the buzz begin! Hey there, Sword Art Online fans. You've waited for it. We've been waiting for it. We are finally covering Sword Art Online 2. How are you guys doing today? So good. I am so happy that we're out of season one. <laughs> <laughs> oh. we're, past, we're past it, and now we're on to something entirely new, and I am so, so excited for it. Joining me on the panel today is Katie Cullen. Hi, all my buddies. Tari Miller. Liz Rishmaui unfortunately couldn't join us today. She's not feeling well. Please tweet her your good well wishes. I'm your host, Megan Salinas, but joining us in the studio today is our very, very special guest, Tony Swan. Swanton? Is that uh, you... Swanton. It rhymes okay. with the rotten. Swanton. I am so sorry <laughs> because I can't pronounce anything. I apologize. But you might recognize Tony. He's worked in the uh, he's worked in the entertainment industry for years and years and years. He's made some of the most recognizable weapons in like all of entertainment and uh, from Man at Arms and he has a store in Burbank. How are you doing today, Tony? I'm doing great. It's a great Sunday afternoon. It is. <laughs> Tony has made, again, he's he's made a bunch of remarkable, really awesome weapons, which we have some of which here in the studio with us today. Elucidator is just one of many. Uh, the Keyblade is another one. And we will, we will talk to Tony a little bit more about that uh, when we get to the interview portion of the show, uh, because I am so excited. I don't know if you guys can see from that top, but he does some spectacular work. Thank These are all much. real. They're all in studio with us. <laughs> yep. And we are using the most restraint I think we've <laughs> ever used here in the studio before because these are just gorgeous. Yeah. Thank you. So let's go ahead and just jump into this episode um, so we can talk to Tony about these beautiful pieces of art that are in front of us right now. We've got two episodes for you today, The World of Guns and Ice Sniper, or Cold Hearted Sniper. I don't know. It's just the names that were on the wiki. Translations! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now that we're not really in the English dubs anymore, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit of a different viewing experience for me personally because I just watched through the dubs. Yeah, right. I have to actually look at the, at the screen instead of multitasking while we watch. <laughs> How about you, Tar? I know you watched in Japanese before, so this is probably just a return to form, huh? Yeah, basically. Like, I, I, I like the original Japanese voices a lot. Um, I feel like they convey a lot of really genuine emotion. Um, I mean, not to say that they dubbed in, because they did an amazing job on the dub as well. It's just, it's like returning home for me. It's like, oh, man, you sound so nice. Well, <laughs> and it, it's just, you know, a lot of people's preference with whatever um, version of the show they like, whether it's the dub or the sub, it's usually whatever they watched first. Right. Unless you watched it when you were, like, a tiny child and had no discerning taste. Yeah. And then you watch it again as an adult, and you're like, yeah, no, the Japanese was better. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, let's go ahead and jump into the world of guns. Uh, we're in a year after the SAO incident wraps up, which I imagine would probably be about 10 months after the events of ALO, maybe, give or take. But it's been about a year since the end of the pre previous season. Mm -hmm. And we are in one of the many MMOs that has been created uh, due to the World Seed, and it is Gun Gale Online. And we are watching kind of the winner's, the winner's wrap-up show, which how weird and meta is that, that you're in a virtual world and you're watching TV? within that virtual <laughs> world. It's kind of odd. It really is. And that they immediately go into, well, if you do this stat, then you can do this. But if you leveled up this way, it no longer works because of this. And, yeah, you, and Megan said it best. I know they're speaking another language, but they're speaking another language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I will be the first to admit I don't play MMOs, so I have no idea if they were making up techno babble or if they were actually saying real MMO lingo. They were right. actually saying real MMO lingo, but coming from Alfheim where they're talking about spells and you level up this way and this is your skill set and this and that. And the other, and immediately going into these highly technical specs for different bullet types, different guns. It really is speaking another language, <laughs> yeah. and it's a little.
little bit of whiplash. You got to get used to it. Yeah, especially when it's the first thirty seconds of the show. And yeah. that's the thing about this per- first episode in particular is that it's very exposition heavy. Uh, but if you can get past that, especially with what we're about to talk about, it it's still really good and really intriguing. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, you interrupted. Oh no, I mean it's fine. I the b- 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 word. Um, <laughs> I mean I liked. I actually really liked that they went into the, all the techno babble because if you're if you're diving into this new world, you wouldn't expect all these pros to be like, yes, and then I pressed up, and then I pressed A, and oh my gosh, I got my first, it's like, no, they're, this is the world that they live in, so it was really immersive, it was like if you're trying to learn a new language, it's like, yeah. you just jump in from the deep end. And if then I pressing, won the game. If you're pressing up and A in dive gear, I'd worry about you. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how you'd go about doing that. But anyway, um, but we do have a bunch of people in this kind of I guess, virtual bar, uh, watching this television show where the top player in Gun Gale Online is basically talking about, yeah, these new kind of features, I suppose, or new strategies that you can use to to really, what's going to be the future of the game. And of course, all these people are like, well, that's not what you said last time. Like, last time, you know, you said use this, and now you're the top player of the game because you obviously had some information that we didn't. And so a lot of people are kind of upset about that. One gentleman, in particular, is really upset. (laughs) And you can tell he's a winner because he's wearing this dark hooded cloak in an anime and (laughs) speaking in a creepy voice. It's like, ah, here we go. Reminiscent of an old group, if I might say so. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if this guy is laughing coffin or not. I don't know if they made it out of SAO. I don't care. This is glorious. I have missed this. Regardless, it's very similar to that. Oh, yeah. This shady looking guy basically stands up, gives this kind of really cryptic speech about true power and everything like yeah. that, and very anime, but he, he points his gun at the television screen, fires, and everybody in the cafe kind of laughs because the, the player who he was aiming at, you know, just kind of goes on talking with the normal broadcast, and everybody's like, what was that supposed <laughs> to do? That was silly. You could just change the channel if you want. <laughs> but then the guy... In a scene very similar, t- and in my mind, to um, Death, Death Note, Note yes. you know, clutches at his chest and disconnects. And they're all like, oh, he's probably just having some internet connectivity issues. I'm sure he'll be back on momentarily. Everybody in this bar cafe are just freaking out because they're like, how on earth did that even happen? Because obviously people dying in MMOs has previously been a thing right. that everybody knows about. And we've just seen it, even though it's physically not supposed to happen anymore. And we've seen any more. <laughs> I know. <laughs> We're still playing MMOs, but this is an issue. But this one's fixed. No one can die in this one. Right? Except they can. <laughs> well, if Mr. Death Gun shoots at them. Yeah, and so basically the cloaked guy, yeah, he, he raises his gun up in the air and he introduces himself in the name of his we- weapon as Death Gun. And that's the opening of this particular season. I worry about people who share names with their weapons. That never goes well. It really that doesn't. That never goes well. <laughs> but it's it just it sets a very somber, dark tone for this particular arc, um, which I believe is called the Phantom Bullet arc. Yes, so far. I think. And and again, it just kind of sets you the tone for no, this is serious again, as opposed to kind of Alfheim, where it was serious for Alfheim Kirito. Because Alfheim wasn't serious. It was serious for Kirito, but everybody else, it literally was just fun and games. Right. Uh, whereas fun and games built on a throne of lies. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. But this one, we're immediately thrust back into a life and death situation. And again, that, that just sets a tone for, for what's to come. Um, but anyway, we, we cut to um, the next scene after that is Asuna and Kirito meeting up for a date uh, in the, um, I forget, the, it's like the inner garden. Uh, yeah, I wrote it down in my notes. I don't remember where they were. Uh, East Garden of the Imperial Palace. In which the audience is granted a history and architecture lesson that I was kind of waiting to come into play. <laughs> it hasn't yet. We'll see. But um, there, uh, it's kind of an introduction to kind of just where technology is at at and, you yeah. know, any given time. And we get this conversation about, you know, the difference between the virtual world and the real world, that the main difference is the quantity of data. 
and how, you know, holding hands in the virtual world isn't really the same as holding hands in the real world. Mm -hmm. There's there's different aspects to it. But um, but something also to kind of point out is that they're wearing their old colors. Yeah. She's wearing the color scheme from when she was in the Knights of the Blood Oath, and he's wearing his black cloak. or Not cloak, but he's wearing a lot of black clothes. So Because he, it's laundry day, <laughs> and he is irresponsible. So it's just Our kind of... Our hero. It's yeah. kind of fitting that, you know, at the start of this new series, that, you know, they're wearing, you know, the colors of their true... Well, not true selves, but avatar selves, I suppose right. you could say. Like We're still souls. traumatized. Let's continue on. <laughs> <laughs> but they're still cute, and I oh, and yeah. I really enjoy watching them together because I do think that they make a cute couple, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I love that she still calls them Kirito. Like, <laughs> it's, and and they still kind of use all their old SAO terms, like, you know, like uh, what did she call it, assistant ge- uh, lieutenant or general or whatever? Yeah, she's yeah. still referring to Heathcliff as, like, the commander, mm-hmm. even though he's not Heathcliff. He was just <laughs> Kayaba Akihiko, this crazy guy. <laughs> instead in of disguise. Instead of, oh, that crazy guy that trapped us in a death game, it was, oh, well, I guess the commander really felt like this. And it's like, no, right. he was that crazy guy that trapped <laughs> You in a death game. <laughs> Who was also your commander? I guess. But it's kind of funny, too, because she refers to um, Liz and Leafa by their avatar names right. as opposed to their actual real-life names, even though she knows them in real life now. Well, that's uh, kind of what you do. When you meet someone online or through a game for the first time and they say, oh, I'm X, you know them as X, even if later on it's, oh, my real name is Y. <laughs> I'm still going to call you X. I can't fathom. There are like five Ys in my life right now. You're going to be X because I need to tell you apart. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It's just going to be a nickname. I do have friends named X and Y. It makes Pokemon interesting. <laughs> really? No. <laughs> I was going to say, you have weird friends. Anyway. Well, yes, but that was a joke. <laughs> anyway, in the middle of their date, we, we flash back um, a couple hours ago because Kirito met with, um, and I'm going to butcher his name. I apologize, but I really don't care about this guy all that much. <laughs> it's Kiku Koa or something um, like that. Kikuwa. 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 Uh, Seijiro. Thank you. That is much better. I'm just going to let Tari pronounce every name from now on because I can't read, apparently. Just call him X. There we go. (laughs) So, Mr. X. Basically, he was the guy that was um, talking to Kirito in the recap. in the extra edition um, where Kirito was relaying, you know, the story of Sword Art Online to him, and he's called him in because of not one but two deaths in Gun Gale Online. Mm-hmm. And they, he's telling them about n- not only did this happen when with gear that's not supposed to happen, you know, where obviously the nerve gear ability to fry your brain, it's, it's no longer an issue with current Amusphere, I think is what they call it. Yeah. With the, Version with the, 2.0 should not be able to murder you. Right. And, like, and physically yet people impossible. are dying. And that wasn't the cause of death, according to the autopsy. It was actually a heart issue. Like, they, they like the person went into, heart car- yeah, went into cardiac arrest, and um, they weren't able to get much from the autopsy because it was a couple of days before anybody found the guy. Like, right. five days, the landlord noticed that there was an odd smell in the apartment, and, oh, <laughs> and that's a dead guy on the head. What's interesting, when, when they first did this, uh, and obviously you can't do it through the nerve gear, um, one of the hypotheses, I guess, is that, you know, somebody broke into the apartment at the exact same time right. and killed them that way, but there's no signs of forced entry and if that's the case, you know, they killed because of a heart issue. So it mm-hmm. would have to be something along those lines. So it's very interesting. And Kirito, um, he's he's kind of obviously very put off by this idea and getting dragged into this. But he's intrigued because he's like, oh, maybe it was some sort of sensory overload. Mm-hmm. But even that doesn't really make much yeah. sense. Um, well, so. uh, there's a, a theory that it's uh, something that's what, uh, aromatic. Uh, because in both cases they found a uh, they found a weird smell. They didn't say it was like dead body smell, but it was like a weird smell. So a way of Point. like overloading the senses. So like I, kind kind of like pumping carbon monoxide into a room right. or something like that. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if while we've got death guns showing off in the game, there's someone at the same time sneaking into the apartment and just being like death goodbye. <laughs> but the fact. Because, oh, well, go ahead. Go ahead. 
I don't know where I was going. <laughs> Sorry. I had a thought and it went away. I apologize. If it comes back, let me know. But it was because... <laughs> two hours later. <laughs> I got Pretty it. Much. That's usually how it works, isn't it? They'll be on Twitter going, I remember. <laughs> but what's interesting about this particular game and this happening in this particular game is that this is the game that people take super seriously because money that you earn in the game can actually be converted into real life currency like Bitcoin. It's like Bitcoin or something. Yeah. If Bitcoin weren't riddled with issues. <laughs> and so people have been actually earning like lots of money by putting a whole bunch of time and effort into this game. So it's a completely different level and vibe of seriousness that you don't get in other games where it is just like, oh, we're just putzing around. It's fun. It's right. like those Call of Duty players that you meet who play like 50 or 60 hours a week and take it really, really seriously. Except these people earn a living. Right. Well, it's like the tournament uh, players. You know, yeah. like the top, like, what is it, SNK uh, fighters and all that stuff? Yeah. So. Yeah. And so it's, it's but very. Call of Duty. It's very interesting that this particular issue, where, you know, again, it has become a life and death issue, has entered into the one game where money happens to be a real life factor. Mm -hmm. And so that, that kind of gets you going, well, is that one of the motives for whoever is causing this and however they're doing it? So we're, we're left with a lot of questions, mainly, who is this? Why are they doing it, first of all? And how are they doing it? Because... It seems impossible. And yeah. it comes down to, Kirito, go investigate. <laughs> yeah. and Please put your life on the line in another death game. And Kirito doesn't want any part of it, but the guy is basically offering him money as an incentive. He's like, you'd be considered a consultant. You know, you would get a fee for being able to help us. Wasn't it like 200K or something? I, I don't recall yeah, how it much it was, lot. but it was definitely enough to make Kirito pause and go, I could order another pie for sure. <laughs> <laughs> like that. all the cake in the world. <laughs> And since they had been talking, he and Asuna had been talking about their future together. That's kind of a big deal. If you are, tr you know, contemplating a future with somebody, money is obviously always a huge factor. Yeah. If they have money to like continue on with their, you know, to start a life together, that's pretty good incentive. Yeah, and provided he, that he survives. And he he thinks about telling her um, when we cut back to their date. He thinks about telling her, but he kind of holds off a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, then. We actually get a scene within Gun Gale Online, and we're introduced to a new blue haired sniper character named Sinon. And she's just taking aim at this one, at this party, and she it looks like she takes this guy out. And that's where the first episode ends. And I am immediately intrigued by this girl because I, I thought from all the promotional artwork that that was Kirito's avatar in Gun Gale Online. She's too competent. <laughs> <laughs> but in, she she is interesting knowing now that that's not her, that that's not actually our main character. I'm intrigued. I'm like, who are you? Where did you come from? You are obviously very good at what you do. I, I want to know more. Mm -hmm. You're in the opening theme. You're either going to play a big part or you're going to die early for the purposes of trauma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't trust opening themes in this show. Sword Art Online openings have Sachi. taught us anything. Oh. <laughs> anyway, before before we move on, I want to talk to you guys really quick about iTunes. Uh, we we hear it after Buzz. We really appreciate all the comments that you guys do. We read the comments on iTunes. We read the comments on YouTube. It really helps when you guys go to iTunes. You leave us a rating and you leave us a comment. It makes us more searchable. It lets our bosses know that you guys think we're doing a good job, and it warms our hearts. We really appreciate you guys guys let giving us your feedback and letting us know what you think so thank you guys all right let's move on to the next episode we can <laughs> rate us got... five stars because we love you and you love us yes all of that let's move on we've got a lot to get through for this next episode um so basically we open up this episode it's actually the past and we see how um how sinon has obtained this really impressive uh it's called the pgm ultima ratio hecat Two. They Sniper named a rifle. gun after the goddess of witchcraft. This thing had better be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, it's it, they it's to, the fact that they've taken time out of the series to go back and show, hey, this weapon is a big deal. It's kind of interesting. Um, and again, we still don't know anything about this character, about who she is, or, or kind of what she's doing within this game. But the fact that she, you know, the the series went back to take time to be like, look, this is important. 
it's kind of a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, we, we cut back to where we were right before where the last episode um, left us. And she's with a, a squad of PVP. Um, yeah, a PVP. P ah, PVP squadron, if I could actually talk. See, I am <laughs> yeah. just all over the place today. Um, but they're basically waiting to ambush another group and assassinate the, the, main, the main threat because that one person has live rounds, which is the most detrimental to, to them and their kind of defenses. Mm -hmm. So they're going to take out that guy, and it's her job to do that. And we get a little bit from them. We find out a little bit about the game, and we find out very, very little about her. Basically, all we really find out is that she's not really a part of this group. She was kind of brought in um, to kind of help them with various things. She's a mercenary. Exactly. Yeah. And that she's not really comfortable talking about who she actually is. And again, that's just, it's very intriguing. It's like, I want to know more about you. I am very interested in what, you know, what you're here for. Mm -hmm. And it's it's very interesting. I, she's so mysterious. I want to know. <laughs> she's like ten thousand percent more interesting than Kirito. Yeah. Well, Let's here's the real. thing. She is very, she is basically a female Kirito, but because of the way the story is unfolding, with because Kirito was the same way. He's this very powerful player, but we weren't given a whole lot about him, and that was sort of unfold. You know, it unfolded slowly. And with her, it's the same thing. She's basically a female Kirito because she's very very powerful obviously and very competent and stoic or at least at least damaged in some way yeah. and and but we don't know anything about her and so it'll be very interesting to see how and how that goes about unfolding and how long it takes before we find out what her motives are yeah and her potentially traumatic backstory, because she's obviously got some traumatic backstory coming from somewhere. Yeah. yeah. As she's taking aim, she makes reference to um, the way she feels and uh, reference to that one day. And it's like, well, what happened that one day? And in the opening, we see not only not only her avatar, but we see a smaller version of her, you know, as she's kind of sitting on the swing. And it's again, that just raises a lot of what questions. What happened to you? <laughs> theory <laughs> is she you? was stuck in SAO and her parents were too and her parents died. Yeah. That's my theory and I'm sticking with it. I, I think that's a sound theory. <laughs> It would explain her motivations for wanting to be really strong. But anyway. Maybe they were killed by Laughing Coffin. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> no spoilers in the comment section, please. <laughs> Laughing Coffin being the murder guild from the first game. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so um, we we the squadron that they're that they're waiting to ambush comes up, but they have a new player, a guy in a cloak, and so immediately is it no, Death Gun? Exactly. It's one of those things where it's like, is it that guy that you know infamously killed a couple people <laughs> just that one time? And they're like, yeah, and they still want her to take out the known entity, and she's like, okay, fine, I will take that guy out first because there's actually um, an ability. It's called a bullet line, and the first one. You can't see it coming, but after that, after you engage like that, that's when you can see these red lines and you know when you're being aimed at. Mm -hmm. But that first one is kind of a free pass, and so she's worried about using her free pass on the not known entity because who knows what that guy is capable of. So she takes out the guy she was assigned to take out and then takes aim at this new guy and he dodges it. And then a, and a firefight ensues between their squadron and her and her squadron. And it's pretty spectacular to watch. Yes. It's, I, I don't feel like I'm watching Sword Art Online with this. I feel like I'm watching like some sort of Mad Max, like dystopian <laughs> future where you know guns are the way. <laughs> it's like 3D Borderlands. Yes. Kind of like that. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, exactly. Only far less like happy people because I feel yeah. like Borderlands, although awesome, uh, it has a much lighter sense of humor. Yeah, a little. <laughs> but I hesitate to use the Call of Duty thing because. Call of Duty. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what were you gonna say? Um, it. I mean, it's it's it. Everyone else is light except for her. Like she's the only one who's taking it like insanely seriously. Like even when she has that moment with the what is his name, uh, Dine. Yeah. Um, and he's like, whatever, we'll just log out. And she's like, no, we're staying here. <laughs> Never give up. Never surrender. <laughs> if you're going to die in the game, at least die, you know, while you're facing down the barrel of a gun. And he's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll keep going. Holy cow. <laughs> the reason girl. this has gone so badly for them is that the unknown entity is a guy 
guy with a minigun. Yeah. It's huge. <laughs> yeah, and we <laughs> find out that lie. we found out that he is not actually Death Gun. He is Behemoth, yeah. and he <laughs> lives up much. to his name. Yeah. <laughs> and and yeah, as you brought up, you know, uh, they're they're starting to think, okay, we are clearly outmatched here. We should peace out. And she's like, no, you know, you can't give up. You know, if you're gonna die in game, you know, die, you know, fighting, go down fighting. And that's what they do. They continue to engage and actually dine. I, yeah, I yeah, think that's how dine. you pronounce it. Um, he actually does just that. He runs forward and he ends up getting killed, but he ends up being able to set off a bomb in the process. And so she uses that cover to go and get a better vantage point so that she can take this guy out. Well, unfortunately for her, he was able to see exactly where she was going. And so he starts taking aim. She jumps off the, um, it was like a clock like tower a, yeah. or something. Yeah. She jumps off and as she's falling to the ground she loses a leg but continues to shoot at him and and Gets him. manages to take him out and it was it, first of all this was just glorious to look at because yeah. it was just gorgeous and and i am Are so we sure excited. she's not our main character i was sure <laughs> i kind of wish she was well, <laughs> go ahead Tari. Tari. <laughs> my like my first thought was she's awesome how long do they put her in a cage oh, oh. yeah no, no yeah that's, <laughs> That's the thing is after, especially after that particular scene, oh. I, I was blown away with how great it looked and how intrigued I was with this character. But I, and I was excited for the first time in this series for like since the Eugene fight. Yeah. I, I was genuinely excited. And then I, yeah, it started to think is like the most, uh, the most the most critical you know, assessment I have of SAO is that it doesn't live up to a lot of the potential that it has. That's right. one of the, my biggest gripes about this series. And so I'm, I'm afraid because right now there is so much potential and I just don't want to be disappointed like I was with the ALO arc. Right. Though, I Disappointment mean, is not the word I'd use. <laughs> Our commenters say that she, like, you know, she, it's a good series. I'm going to trust them and hope that, like, nothing disappointing happens. And it, Well, it's still going on. They don't know what Endgame is mm. for this particular uh, people series. People who've read the light novels might. That's, That's true. true. <laughs> anyway. Steven over there is raising his hand in the booth. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Steven Lemieux, our booth guy, he's a hardcore SAO fan, and he knows what's up. Anyway. No spoilers. No, no spoilers, spoilers anyway. commenters. You're but usually anyway, very good at this. Anyway, we cut back. Um, she logs out after she's taken out this guy, and we see that it's a young girl, and she just kind of is lamenting to herself that she needs to get stronger. And then we cut to, um, meanwhile, in Alfheim Online. <laughs> back at the ranch. <laughs> and we have Liz and Leafa and Silica fighting bosses so that they can get materials for um, for Liz to create new swords and everything like that, because that's what she's good at. And, of course, Kirito and Asuna are just kind of hanging out. And it's fun hearing them, like, gossip about, like, oh, they're all over each other all the time. Oh, my gosh. They even do this at school, and Leafa gets this, what? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Leafa. They do what? <laughs> And that's and we end the episode with basically Kirito sitting up and telling Asuna he's like I have to tell you something. Thank God. And I'm really <laughs> glad that it looks like he's going to tell her about uh, this offer that he's been given because I would have really hated it if he had been like I'm the black swordsman I have to go and do this alone and <laughs> just like uh, no no you at least tell your girlfriend where you're gonna be. Right. Are we avoiding unnecessary drama this time? I have we learned so. that lesson? <laughs> The other thing I'm afraid of uh, is that the characters that I know and love have been relegated to cheerleaders, and I, I don't want that. I, I don't know if that's where the series is going, but that's kind of what the opening hints that they're going to be. I choose to look at it the same way I looked at the lack of Klein in the second half of season one. He was not dumb enough to go back in. Right. <laughs> Nobody just... in this group, Carrie Toe aside, is dumb enough to go into <laughs> Gun Gale Online when people are dying and it's a hardcore shooter game. They're just like, nope. They're yeah. just, I'm staying yeah. in the land of fairies. <laughs> They're just going to stay where they know they won't die of cardiac arrest. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Uh, I'd okay. like to think that it's going to be the SAO high that we wanted. <laughs> oh, great. that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> I'd Sword like Art that. Online High School. Anyway, so that basically wraps up the second episode. And now, Tony, thank you so, so much for coming in. Um, I, I really, obviously you do amazing work, and we have Elucidator there at the far end, which is Kirito's sword from, uh, from the first season. 
Oh my gosh, that just looks beautiful. <laughs> Man, is that pretty. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the process of this of creating this particular sword. Well, this sword is uh, created out of 1075 spring steel. Uh, we cut it out on a bandsaw and then used a plasma cutter to cut out the inside and shaped everything with a file. And then the outside has been, uh, after heat treating and uh, tempering, I've polished off the edge and uh, these elements here for the pommel and the hilt and the cross on the center has been uh, chemically blackened with a uh, black oxide. Hmm. And then we polished everything out and did the nickel silver kind of cross button on there and the emblem on the side and riveted everything together and chopped stuff up with it. <laughs> it's a beautiful piece. Thank you. It is. Oh, so for for this particular one, I, oh, gosh, how did I, I know that I, we watched the Man at Arms episode. Yeah. Um, which parts had to be outsourced? Uh, this one, uh, the, the only outsourcing really was uh, to send it out to get it uh, chemically blackened for the black oxidizing. Uh, the place that does it is a bit like where the uh, the Riddler or Joker, whichever one, fell into the vat of acid. There's oh. these giant <laughs> bubbling vats of acid that, you know, junk all over the floor. I mean, so we bring it in there and they immerse it into these, uh, these vats and it uh, changes the color of the metal and then we polish off the edge. Nice. It looks absolutely amazing. Would I think you, we're all just in awe right now. Yeah. yeah. Would you be mad if maybe that sword disappeared at some point? I, I, yeah, I'd be a little mad. Probably, yeah, so. Little mad. Would you yeah. forgive us, though? <laughs> yeah. No. But, no. 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 I'd use but one of my other swords. Obviously, you've been working in the entertainment industry, and you've created some of the most amazing weapons that we've mm -hmm. seen. When did you decide you wanted to be a blacksmith? It just kind of happened. Uh, I started my uh, business when I was 15 years old. Prior to that, I was cutting gemstones and making jewelry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started making knives and swords and suits of armor. And uh, it went from there uh, when I actually opened up a retail shop in 1988 in uh, North Hollywood. Uh, one of my first jobs was making armor for Michael Jackson for his tour, as well as uh, he wore it to Elizabeth Taylor's wedding, and it was on the cover of People magazine. Wow. Um, and then I made the hook for the movie Hook, and from that point, uh, word of mouth just generated enough business that uh, I was all, always busy with film and television and so forth. I've, I've worked on over 200 movies. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. and uh, especially we uh, we got to go to um, see uh, so, um, your what, shop yeah. in Burbank, and yeah. it, like you have it on display there, the hook, and it is mm -hmm. so gorgeous and just so intricate. Yeah, that was, a, that was a real fun one. That was built in 1991, but uh, my shop, The Sword and the Stone, is open to the public on Saturdays, so most Saturdays, unless I'm doing something. I was recently creating armor at the Getty Museum in, uh, on the top of the hill in L.A., uh, so, you know, at that point, the shop wasn't open, but uh, you're welcome to come in or look me, look me up online at www.swordandstone.com and see some of the things, but uh, I have the cases of the weapons, of the 39 weapons I made for man-at-arms uh, on display, so you can see all these pieces. Uh, generally, under glass, you're not going to be able to handle them. <laughs> um, and other pieces that are, you know, iconic pieces, like the hook or Jack Sparrow's sword or Conan's sword, stuff like that are actually on display at my shop. Hmm. What's one of the more difficult pieces that you've had to make, and what made it difficult? Uh, I don't know. They're, they're, they're always a, a complex kind of build. You know, I have to figure out the processes involved in making it, uh, depending on the details going into it. And uh, people always ask me that, what's you know, the most difficult or more uh, challenging? And the most challenging thing I get is the turnaround time. Uh, when I was making these weapons, I did six and a half seasons of uh, Man at Arms. I'm actually uh, finished with that right now. We'll probably be doing another show uh, in, upcoming soon. But um, I made each of the uh, six weapons over a five-day filming schedule. So wow. in, normally when a uh, production contacts me, I need six weeks to three months to create something that elaborate. Hmm. And we have pieces, you know, like the Sword of Omens here from uh, Thundercats or, um, you know, some of the other elements that I've made that are just major undertakings. Uh, Longclaw's sword from uh, Game of Thrones I made is 45 separate pieces of steel forged together to make the composite blade to show that little snake pattern down the middle of the fuller on it. Wow. So uh, that one we actually started a little bit earlier to create that. 
And uh, then we have the other uh, processes where we have to sculpt and mold the, the hilt and pommel elements and then uh, burn those out and cast them, pour molten bronze into it. Um, that's a three-day process alone just with the, uh, the molding and everything. So Dang. It, <laughs> it gets a little, a little crazy. I would imagine. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. What's a typical day at the shop like? Because I imagine you get people who just light up mm -hmm. when they come into the store. Uh, well, my showroom, like I said, is open on Saturdays. But uh, for me at the shop, um, you know, I start out and uh, I'll go back there, generally create some swords. I mean, in the last few weeks, we've created a stainless steel armor that happened not to be used for the Video Music Awards for MTV, um, which was like a three-day build. It was a beautiful piece, but it may show up on tour. We also, at the same time, created a, a, a copy of Joffrey's crown from Game of Thrones that uh, Adam Sandberg wore at the Emmys, uh, <laughs> you know, oh. when uh, Weird Al Yankovic. And um, I'm trying to think of what else was going on there. But, you know, this is all happening concurrently. Um, I need to go back uh, this evening and uh, make uh, three swords for uh, Sleepy Hollow to ship out to North Carolina tomorrow morning. Ooh. Nice. Uh, uh, <laughs> Stephen popped, Stephen popped up in the booth. Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. He's I on do the, the sleepy. after show for it here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I've got uh, I think uh, twelve or twenty-four swords out there currently, and then they have another storyline coming in with uh, some different elements where they're having flashbacks at Sleepy Hollow, so they'll be renting some of my uh, historical armor of various uh, eras. Nice. So that's think, that's a typical day. I mm. think our booth guy is geeking out <laughs> there. He's just yeah. sleepy hollow. That's so well, exciting. I, I sell my T-shirts at my shop and little patches that I normally wear, but uh, we want to make a, like a little flannel bib that you can put on so as people walk in and they start drooling or whatever, <laughs> <laughs> having their nerdgasm that they can you know, absorb the fluid. So, yeah. Having been in there and seen the display mm, case, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely, for sure. Uh, obviously, you've worked on so many different things. Do you? I mean, I know it's probably impossible, but do you have? Are there any projects that stood out in your mind that you're like, that was my favorite to work on? Uh, you know, uh, there's been a, a couple that are really fun. Um, we did a lot of stuff for Thor, and uh, we actually made a 39-inch tall Infinity Gauntlet with actual gemstones wow. set into it. Uh, that was a six-week process with uh, probably 12 to 15 people working night and day on it, um, whenever that was a few years ago. Um, it had a nanosecond exposure during the first Thor movie <laughs> that we, you know, it was just passed in, you know, <laughs> yeah. in the Asgard thing. and. That was a really fun project to work on, and I'm hoping it actually shows up in more of the Marvel universe. Um, it will. <laughs> yeah. 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 Considering yeah. that this is what Avengers 3 is supposed to focus on, I'm, right. I'm pretty sure that will come back in spades. Yeah. Well, you know, is it, in that point, they're supposed to be wearing it, and um, this is over three feet tall. I mean, <laughs> oh, true. Uh, so the, you know, it's a, it's a pretty massive piece. But, just kind of wear it like yeah. this. <laughs> just drag it on the ground. <laughs> I don't think this is what this was designed for. <laughs> I have power. <laughs> I can't lift it, but I have it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the other things is uh, I've been contacted a lot lately by a lot of the uh, video game companies. Um, in Man at Arms, I've taken weapons that they've designed that showed in their games. They're very elaborate builds that don't exist except in the game. So I, I'll take those and make it real. And so uh, they're either getting it for their convention uh, showing, um, like we did with uh, Riot for uh, replicating the uh, Katrina's uh, Zenith Blade from League of Legends. Mm -hmm. That was shown at Anime Expo. And, uh, you know, doing some similar stuff for them and, you know, possibly some things for Blizzard and some other companies. So. So have you been uh, have you been hitting up the convention scene for very long, or is that more recent? Uh, I've been going to Comic Con for over twelve years. Uh, I used to have a booth there. It was set up like a medieval castle, like my showroom walls are actually the the castle from Army of Darkness. So when you walk is in, that what that was? Uh, yeah, all the oh. rock walls in there. So <laughs> that's I, her second favorite movie ever. Right. Well, I, I was working on Hook at that time, but they wanted me to do the evil Ash Hand at the same you know same point, and so I I had to decline that commission. Oh, that's a bummer. But yeah. still, that's yeah. really cool. So my my. Uh, booth at Comic Con was those rock walls and various suits of armor that we had on display and weapons and everything and 
pretty phenomenal booth babes walking around in some of the armor <laughs> that I made. So uh, I think that was more of a distraction. We didn't make much sales, but we got a lot of interest. <laughs> <laughs> really, you think you did? You're like, I'm not. It's hard to focus. What did? What? What are we here for again? I don't remember. <laughs> well, you, you got 12 people deep trying to get to the booth to take pictures with you know a beautiful girl wearing a metal bikini. But they're not spending any money. <laughs> yeah. So we realized that that wasn't a good thing. So I stopped uh, having a booth at Comic-Con, but I still go out there and, uh, you know, some of the other local conventions. Every now and then. Yeah. Um, do you hit up, uh, I, I imagine just um, your, obviously, services would probably be solicited by a lot of different sources. Do you go to Renaissance fairs, or is that kind of something that you just don't have time for? I started with Renaissance fairs when I was 15, 16 years old. I would go out to fair, and uh, through my early 20s, I was out at the Renaissance fair with a group of uh, German mercenaries wearing armor of my own construction, carrying big swords and things, and marching in parades. Um, but with my business right now, I really don't have that much time to go to the Renaissance fairs or that type of thing. Um, I do have a flash mob of Vikings. Uh, I do the Capital One commercials where the Vikings, the Visigoths, are out there. So. Uh, since we have all those costumes available, I've uh, you know recycled them and we use them. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll be going to Oktoberfest down in Alpine <laughs> Village with about 60 to 100 people dressed as Vikings to have a uh, Viking birthday party for uh, one of our members uh, that we do every year. So, wow! So you can find that it's a uh, you know uh, Norse Hollywood dining Vikings. Look that up, and <laughs> you'll, you'll see some of our shenanigans. It's you know pretty fun awesome. do, you, do you ever get blown away when you see obviously the things that you've created like on the screen or do you kind of get mad like oh they should have shown it like this to get you know get it better in the light uh it's it's always a trip to watch you know i mean um you know walking through new york through times square and then all of a sudden see your work projected up onto a billboard or something you know it's just like um or sunset boulevard same thing it's um uh if we go back to Hook, the movie poster for Hook was the Hook all over the place. Uh, same thing for Blade and Zorro and you know stuff like that. You'll see the weapons that I've created as the prominent feature of the the billboard and uh, bigger than life, and it's it's really gratifying. That's awesome, and it sounds really cool. And obviously, you do amazing work. You mentioned earlier that you have some other stuff in development right now. I know that when mm -hmm. things are in the early stages, sometimes uh, you can't really talk about some stuff, but can you tell us a little bit about your upcoming projects? Uh, well, I am working with a couple video game companies to create some weapons for them. Um, I am, I'm done with the, the filming with Defy for Man at Arms. They have a new crew that I recommended who are doing a, a thing called uh, Man at Arms Reforged, which is kind of a mashup, uh, but I have no affiliation with them. Uh, I actually finished filming uh, the 39th weapon build was in um, uh, end of March this year, and uh, we had a development deal with a uh, production company to try and sell a reality show. But I thought it'd make great TV between the Vikings and all the <laughs> other craziness we do, and uh, that hasn't actually uh, been picked up yet. But it's still pending, so who knows there? And you know, I may do some more uh, YouTube stuff. There was 80 million views on Man at Arms. Uh, I was coming back from a blacksmith event in Washington, D.C., got recognized at uh, Washington Airport and LAX. It was, um, it's uh, really a trip. So. Well, thank you so, so You're much for welcome. coming in. I, I'm afraid we're running a little bit short on time today. Uh, we got started a little late. But thank you so much for coming in. Where can people go online to find out more about you and about the amazing work mm -hmm. you do? Well, my website is www.swordandstone.com. Um, you can also see the uh, Norse Hollywood Dining Vikings on Facebook and find me on Facebook for Sword and Stone or Tony Swatton, that's S-W-A-T-T-O-N. And uh, you can Google me and see a lot of things. I've done uh, armor making tutorials with Stan Winston School of Character Arts. That's online. Um, I, I don't know. I, I did a Google search <laughs> the other day and it goes for like 30 pages. So there's a lot of stuff you can find out. That's awesome. Thank you so, so, so much for coming in. Yeah. Tari Miller, where can the people find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Tari J. That's T-A-U-R-I-J-A-Y. Uh, you can also find me on uh, the Doctor Who's Classic panel on Wednesdays and the upcoming Legend of Korra panel. 
Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Tumblr at Kiaxe, that's K-I-A-X-E-T. I am also on the Attack on Titan and Z Nation panels on Sunday, Classic Doctor Who and Upcoming Arrow on Wednesday, and Ruby every other Thursday. We will have an episode this week. Yay! I'm Megan. You can follow me on Twitter at the Menguin. That's T H E M E N G U I N. I am on most of those shows. <laughs> Everything uh, but Arrow. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Again, Tony, thank you so, so much for coming in today. This was a huge treat. Thank you guys for watching. We will see you guys next time. From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz you later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.